we have seen that the great loving self-consciousness of the Godhead wanted opportunity to manifest itself. If this was going to be, there had to be moral creatures in the image of God, as it were, who could tune in on the same wavelength of life. And so God did this remarkable thing of creating mankind in his own image after his likeness and gave us the wonderful enlightenment to live a happy life with him. We have suggested that we should consider ourselves as a complete unit rather than trying to segregate different parts of our personality with the thought that we, they might act independently of the rest of our personality. It seems rather that we are a complete operating unit and need our total equipment, shall we say, to live a life that God intended us to do. Uh, God, of course, had planned that we should have a fullness of life, that we should have a fullness of the vertical relationship with him, which was absolute. And only God has absolute intimacy and contact with our inner personalities. And therefore, we see that there can be no substitute for the life that God had planned to live within us. And when man tries to substitute his own selfishness rather than, than a loving submission to God, whereby he can experience God, he, of course, loses the essence of life that God intended to be lived. We saw, in addition to the vertical, God designed many, many lovely relationships with us as human beings. Uh, through the five senses of communication. We saw that the vertical relationship was alone preparing us uh, for the horizontal relationship of friendship. Because only as we have the life of God circulating through our hearts and lives are we kept in a condition where we can really expose ourselves to each other. And friendship is based on a willingness to expose ourselves and when we limit our self-exposure, this is the limit of friendship, of course. So God had some great and glorious plans. He also planned that our physical life and observation should be a very exciting thing without any end of remarkable discoveries. And as we would make these many observations and discoveries, uh, we would have a basis for appreciating the great energy of God, which we wouldn't know apart from all of these wonderful creations. Now we want to develop a very firm and intelligent thing that needs to be kept constantly in mind and which apparently has not been in the mind of many theological leaders. And so we say that the unalterable condition of any kind of a relationship with God and with each other must be the fulfillment of the Ten Commandments. And so there are absolute relationships that are established, and these are, in, these are relationships of intelligence. In other words, of course, as you realize, the Ten Commandments is a product of the intelligence of God. The Ten Commandments did not create obligation. Obligation existed. God is trying to define obligation when he gives us these lovely rules. So at the bottom of your page two, we mention these unalterable conditions. The unalterable condition, of course, is the attitude of intelligence. And as soon as we're going to have this attitude, there must be a recognition of the supremacy of God, and there must be a recognition of the equality of each other. We must not only recognize the supremacy of God, but have some realization of the dimensions of God. And so it's such a lovely thing to think about, isn't it? that everything that God does, he does out of perfect objective intelligence. And nothing is arbitrary. He doesn't decide this to do one here once, then some, something else another time, then something else another time. Like some theolog theological leaders would have us believe that God is kind of arbitrarily dealing in various dispensations. And the various things change as they stay oftentimes in these different dispensations. But here is an absolute situation that must exist in any process of relationship that God may have with us. And so we need to appreciate this very deeply, do we not? 
We have studied the process of revelation. Uh, we know that when Adam and Eve revolted, uh, God began a long process of revelation to try to recreate in their minds the position of intelligence. Because when a person's going to revolt, there has to be, first of all, the blanking out of intelligence. And so God has a problem, as we talked about, under the Bible, in the enlightening man's mind uh, into the position of intelligence as far as relationship with God and with each other is concerned. Then there was the gradual process, little by little, as God got the ear of respectable persons who would be willing to re recognize the great being of God. And so we have the different leaders in Old Testament history. And above all, God designed uh, to do a great thing and prepared a man for 80 years to bring this about. And so here had to be a preparation of great intelligence in the first place. Because here was going to be a man that would relate himself directly to the intelligence of God. So there obviously would have to be the ultimate of intelligence that human beings could attain. And this is what Stephen said, you remember, as he reviewed the history of God's dealing. He said, Moses was a man mighty in deed and understanding and truth. Then God had to prepare him by way of humiliation for 40 years. So he would be humble enough to be trusted with such an adventure. And finally he comes up in the very presence of God and goes through the cloud and, and, and into the thunder and lightning. My, what a fearful situation to think of. And here we have the rather millions of people watching this great adventure when a man is going to go up to God. And God is going to apply his intelligence to our relationships. And that's all the Ten Commandments is. An application of the mind of God trying to give us a few simple definitions, a few simple ideas of that status of life and attitude apart from which there can be no happiness whatever. Isn't it strange that theologians have developed the ideas they have? You have probably heard that God did not give the Ten Commandments to be obeyed. He gave the Ten Commandments to show that man can't obey them. I would wonder where that idea came from in the Bible. And they give the idea that no one ever does fulfill the Ten Commandments, that they are unreasonable and illogical. That we're just simply not able to conform, and God knew what we couldn't, they say. Well, I declare, when you sit down to read the Bible, you just don't find those ideas, do you? And so here is God's ultimate simple description as to what are the principles of attitudes that have to exist in any kind of a spiritual relationship. So again, we look at our God-man chart and we say that God put his eye at the eye point where he asks us to put our eye and he views himself in self-consciousness and of course he recognizes his unthinkable immense greatness and there wouldn't be any blackboard or anything in existence whereby we could not really proportion this matter as it should be. Would You'd almost have to ride God way up here in the sky, wouldn't you? And, and have ourselves way down here in some little tiny position. And it's shocking we have books written as though God is on the second floor of something like that. I guess these folks have no concept of the dimensions of God. And, and here we have God's viewpoint as he puts his eye to the same point he asks us to keep our eye at, which of course is the eye of intelligence. And he sees his great self-consciousness, doesn't he then, in austerity and greatness. Then he sees us in our smallness. And there was certain excitement we saw in our smallness, realizing that we would never exhaust our investigation and knowledge of the great being of God. And so the point of intelligence establishes this situation. And uh, God set himself to give a few general ideas of uh, what uh, must be true if this relationship is going to be maintained. So I'm sure we all agree that there can't be any state of happiness except living in this balanced, intelligent condition. And so all the Ten Commandments are trying to do is to define intelligence. And as I have said, the Ten Commandments do not create obligation. Intelligence creates obligation. 
God is simply trying to define uh, what is real and what is true. Uh, we shouldn't have it necessary to repeat these commandments. We have two accounts of them. Uh, we do mention in the notes here, there must be supreme love to God, of course, who can have anything else but this in any view of reality. And uh, since God is a spiritual being, we're not to make any images. God did not want us to see some physical image and bow down in obeyance to some physical thing. Because uh, spirituality was a far deeper and broader relation. In other words, you couldn't possibly put in any human image any concept of the dimensions of God. And if we try to do this, uh, we lose the very concept of God's greatness. So you see, this was an intelligent thing. And God wanted us to be honest and respectful. He wanted us to be reverent toward Him, who could conceive of anything except this being right and proper. Then God thinks it's a good idea that we have a day every week that we spend time as much as possible away from our earthly burdens and pursuits and consider our relationship to God in meditation and, and spiritual development. And you remember Jesus said the Sabbath was not made for, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the, but the Sabbath was made for man. And so this is God's decision as to what's good for us. We Christians believe, as the early church seemed to start, that the, the greatest thing now to remember was not creation, but the greatest thing was to remember was the accomplishment of the atonement, which of course is finalized in the resurrection. And so the early church apparently began to observe the Lord's Day instead of the day of creation. And we will have another word to say about this principle. And so here is God's decision as to what's good for us. Then he looks at our relationship in the human sphere, doesn't he? And uh, we learn as we bring our own children to maturity what parenthood really means. And uh, we never love our parents quite as much after, until after we have gone through the discipline and self-exercise of heart and life in bringing our own children to maturity. Then we understand all that's involved in this responsibility. And so God said it is absolutely right then in all the sacrifice of parenthood that we should respect our parents. So God can't conceive any other idea of intelligence, can he? And then he declares against murder, adultery, theft false witness or misrepresenting things in any sort, and against covetousness, this restless dissatisfaction with what we have, which the scripture, the New Testament application calls idolatry, a setting our hearts and affections on objects and a dissatisfaction with our present state. Now there can't be any happiness in this state of covetousness. If I'm always restless on what I think I don't have and what I think I should have, then this, of course, blocks out all happiness. And you can imagine what's going on commonly in, in Christian circles with all the restlessness of advertisements and so on. They're trying to create dissatisfaction and trying to create a desire to have things. And, and, and if we're going to set our mind on things and, and, and the experiences on this earthly sphere, then, of course, we're going to lose the fragrance of heavenly relationship. So here God gave these simple rules to Moses and not only this, uh, but he, he wrote them upon tablets. And not only wrote them, but spoke them verbally as to what the people should do. Now uh, we should look, don't you think, at the way the people felt about these Ten Commandments before we decide whether they're reasonable or not. They ought to know more than we, don't you think? And do we give you a reference here to, uh, to Exodus 24.3. And here we see that the people said all that the Lord had said we will do. They didn't think there was anything unreasonable in God's giving them the Ten Commandments. They thought God was helping them. That's exactly what God was doing, trying to help us to be happy. He's trying to give us some rules which will lead to happiness, in other words. Then Moses came and recounted to all the people all the words of the Lord. And all the ordinances and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. So they thought it was reasonable what God was telling them to do, didn't they? We turn to another passage in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and 
Deuteronomy is a recount, as you know, of the developments of the previous books and all God's dealings with mankind as Moses is now getting ready to leave. Then Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and ordinances which I am speaking today in your hearing, that you may learn them and observe them carefully. And so Moses expected that they were able to do what God said, and they were to give their concentrated attention to this matter, and that, that God wasn't trying to make it hard for them. He was trying to lead them, to help them to see the state of life apart from which there could not be happiness. Uh, we have a couple of verses you might want to add to your notations, uh, 27 and 29 of the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy. Uh, here we, we have the, the leaders of Israel in verse uh, 27 uh, asking for what Moses was told by God. In other words, they believed that God was not going to make them unhappy. He was trying to teach them uh, some rules that would make them happy. And uh, so they said, go near and hear all the words uh, our God says. Then speak to us all that the Lord had, our God will speak to you. They're talking to Moses here. And we will hear it and do it. They seem anxious that they should hear God's description, didn't they? And then think of God's lamentation here. Verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always. That it may be well with them and with their sons forever. So God thinks they could keep the commandments he gave them. And that they were reasonable and that God was manifesting his love in, in this bestowal. Oh, how beautiful and lovely to see the heart of God as he's always trying to help us to live that life which will bring happiness to him and to us. Uh, we have in the 10th chapter of Deuteronomy a very uh, good summary of God's uh, ideas here of happiness. And uh, in verses 12 and 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today, for your good. Notice everything God does is for our good. God never does anything to make it hard for us. He's always trying to help us because he knows there's no conceivable way of happiness except the way of intelligence. And as soon as we open our minds to honest investigation, we have to recognize the supremacy of the great being of God and the equality of each other. And this is all God is trying to define in his rules and regulations, is it not? And uh, we have many references too as to other uh, leaders' evaluation of this. Uh, you have uh, these different instances we give you and dear Paul uh, evaluates this. He says the commandments are holy, just, and good, and so on. Now look at this interesting development we find, which you're aware of, of course. But let us look at it again. The dear Lord comes upon the scene, and he simplifies the ten and reduces them to two ideas. And here you have in the 22nd of Matthew, where a lawyer asks him uh, some questions, trying to trap him. Do we notice this sweet way Jesus responded to those who tried to trap him? Notice his, his loving response and his trying to, to balance out their attitude and, and to sow some good seed. So here we have, they're trying to uh, trap him now, test him. So 22, 16 of Matt, 36 of Matthew, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment, or the first and great commandment. And a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend or is being suspended the whole law and the prophets. In other words, Jesus is saying, really, God is trying to define twofold attitude to uh, uh, there has to be first a vertical, a vertical relation of respect to God. And if you do this, you'll fulfill the first four. In other words, if you have a right attitude toward God, then you'll fulfill what God asks you to do toward Him. 
And if we have a right attitude toward each other, then we'll fulfill the, the other six of the Ten Commandments. So Jesus reduces the ten to twofold to a twofold direction of a right attitude, doesn't he? And uh, there can't be any change in this. Look at another lawyer's uh, question here in the 10th chapter of Luke. And then verses 25 to 28. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, Jesus said, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And so this lawyer was well versed, and he said, he answered, said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Do you notice the word your as we read these things? It simply says, take your ability and use it rightly. It does not say all the strength we would have if we'd never sinned. It does not raise different technicalities. It simply says you have a certain quantity of strength and personality. Take your personality and use what you have rightly. And certainly we can take our abilities and direct them rightly, can't we? And so what did Jesus say here? You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now here is a present tense imperative mode of command. And we might render it, keep on continually doing this and you shall live. And this is still in effect. But wait a minute. Stay on the train. We will develop how this is done now in our age. We are now seeing that what Jesus said came out of intelligence and there can't be any process of salvation that doesn't bring about a fulfillment of the Ten Commandments. The wonderful revelation of grace indicates a new relationship, doesn't it? But this cannot be a lessening of the requirements. Then we have the apostolic writers developing this further, don't we? And so they reduce the two of Jesus to one word, love, which we have defined as an intelligent, objective acceptance of truth. Remember, salvation is to come to the knowledge of the truth. Of course, the ABCs of truth is to recognize God in his dimensions, ourself and our humility, each other on equality, come to the knowledge of the truth, a basis of salvation apart from which there is no salvation. And apostolic writers reduce the two to one word then. Isn't this a wonderful development? And just a sample here, Romans 13, 8 to 10. The apostle Paul affirms this great essence of love. He owe no one nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor or the other involved in the fellowship. You notice that margin if you're reading the New American Standard Bible, I suggested that you habitually do look at your margin here because this is very helpful in your study. So the other involved in a relationship. And if we do this, we have fulfilled the law. And then Paul goes on to enumerate some of the th things of the law. And he says in verse 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. So if we have a right attitude then, we'll be respectful to God and we'll be considerate to each other. And so the 10 comes into the 2 and into the 1. And of course, the gospel has for its purpose to restore us into a loving, happy relationship of love. Now uh, we know it is revealed in this wonderful age of grace that we're not under law. We have uh, this a number of times. Uh, we have it especially in, in uh, Romans 6.14 as a sample. 
Sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Now, it's not the Ten Commandments here, I don't think, that's referred to. You notice there's no article in the New American Standard Bible, and there's none in the Greek text. I don't think it's referring to the Ten Commandments here. It's referring to a principle of regulation. So we're not supposed to be under rules of regulation in this wonderful age. We're supposed to be under a grace of intimate relationship in the Holy Spirit whereby the Lord Jesus becomes a reality in our minds. We touched briefly in our early lecture on the, how we are to be lights in this world, not in our own strength, but in the new, living, intimate relationship in the Holy Spirit. When we had our chart studying duration, we saw that here was a new adventure that God entered into at Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit was to be given to be in us, Jesus said, not with us, only, but in us, in a new intimate relationship. And Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, He's going to take the things of mine and make them real to you. In other words, this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit wants to recreate in our minds the life, teaching, atonement, love of Jesus. And as we look in our inner sacred minds at the love and wonderful experience of Jesus and keep our eyes upon this, we're filled with the love of God and we just want to live for God out of buoyancy and happiness. And this is the idea of grace, is it not? A newness of intimacy with God. Why? Be very exciting to have time to talk about 2 Corinthians 3.18. We did have that worked out for you under the messenger section, you may remember. But let's just look at this a moment here. Uh, we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Here is a most remarkable passage and should be meditated upon with profound regard. In other words, the Holy Spirit wants to recreate in our minds the true life and teaching and atonement and love of Jesus and make it so real that we live our lives with excitement in realizing the life of Jesus in His resurrected glory in His love. And if we keep our eyes on Jesus, we don't need rules and regulations. Now, we just, we, I suppose we all know what we're talking about, but let's go over it and, and refresh ourselves in this beautiful idea. And so we are to now have a relationship with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit that's so intimate that we do not need rules and regulations. We walk, in other words, by sensitivity. As many as being led by the Holy Spirit, these are the tons of God. So there's a new intimacy, a new relationship, a new drawing power. This is God's new plan, that we shouldn't walk by rules and regulation. So we don't really need the Ten Commandments to live our Christian life if we are looking to Jesus like we should do it. Because it is fragrant love that draws us into the life that we are to live. God's doing something tremendous, in other words. Oh, my. As we sit down and study the New Testament and see the promises and the beautiful development of what God is doing here, bless the Lord, we can be so happy and we didn't believe it. We should be happy that there would be such wonderful things written in a book of intimacy that God wants to enter. That's what the Scripture says, isn't it? That the resurrected, glorious Jesus is supposed to become a part of our mind, beholding for yourself as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Here's something to be personalized, isn't it? And as we keep looking at this mirror, as the Holy Spirit creates the, the resurrected life of Jesus and all it means to us, and we keep looking at this wonderful mirror that the Holy Spirit recreates, we don't need rules and regulations. We just keep our eyes on the mirror. Now, if we want to know whether we're under grace, we take the Ten Commandments and see whether we're fulfilling them without trying to. And if we're not fulfilling the Ten Commandments, we're not living under grace. Why doesn't this need to be thought through, my friends? We have all kinds of expressions by very extensive denominations that the idea of grace is compromise. Leniency. And you hear such statements as this. 
I'm so glad I didn't live in Old Testament times. Things were so strict. You couldn't get away with what things you can now get away with. And they call this grace. My friends, this is 100% or 1,000% wrong. The more abundant of God's blessing, the greater our obligation, not the less. And so they have taken the beautiful word grace and equated it with compromise and leniency. A complete distortion of the idea. The word grace means abundance of intimacy. And God couldn't bring this abundance, as we're going to see next week, except the precious atonement of Jesus had become a reality so we would be humbled by the love and sacrificial death of Jesus so we could get down where we belong and God lifts us up then where we don't belong. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Do we see the excitement of principle here now? Rules and regulations were good and, and we refer to Romans 8, 3 and 4 to fortify exactly what we've said here. What the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh. Nothing wrong with the law, nothing wrong with the descriptions. There was a lack of willingness on the part of mankind to discipline themselves. To bring about this happy life. And now God says, I'm going to give you an extra push, an extra help in your unwillingness to discipline yourself. I'm going to give you a motivation of love and tenderness and compassion to draw you into this beautiful life I want you to live. God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That is, he gave us such a realization as to what Jesus had to do that we might be forgiven. That, that we felt, oh my, if Jesus had to do all this for me, there's got to be an end of everything in my life that's hurting such a Savior. And so here was the great conquest of the sacred atonement. And what is the result? Verse 4, in order that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who aren't trying to fulfill law, you see. We're not trying to fulfill rules. We're trying to walk by sensitivity who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Oh, ponder this remarkable, remarkable development. And dear Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. What was the joy set before him? That he might bless us like this. That we might have a radiating blessing of intimacy with Jesus. Well, the scripture uses marriage as an illustration of our relationship, doesn't it? And if two hearts are pure, like we talked about this morning, and they're self-sacrificing and giving themselves for each other, they don't need rules and regulations, do they? They are sharing life in the beautiful intimacy of total personality. But then when this lovely bird of affection and romance is ushered out the door and they see it flying away at a great distance, then maybe laws and rules have to come in. And if things get serious enough, something has to provide for the family. And so God never intended there should be anything but precious affection, did he? And the scripture uses this as an illustration of our relationship to Jesus in Romans 7, 1 to 5, married to another. Who? Even to him who is raised from the dead. What's the result? That we should bring forth fruit unto God. Oh, do we see the fragrancy of these beautiful things? And it's so blessed for us to go over again, although we may realize this many, many times in our studies. And so there can't be any process of salvation that doesn't become intelligent. There can't be any happiness apart from recognizing God. There can't be any relaxation apart from recognizing each other. And I get so blessed over the idea that everything that God asks us to do, He does out of perfect intelligence as what is for our good. In other words, as Moses wrote, for thy good. God's not trying to make us unhappy. He's trying to help us to live that life apart from which there can't be any happiness. And we need to uh, reaffirm this, don't you think, before our fellow beings? There's such a distortion of this whole concept, just as God was imposing something upon per people, trying to make them unhappy, and God is not trying to do this. It's so lovely, isn't it, uh, to relax and say with Peter, 
uh, when Jesus was discouraged and so many were going away, he said, Lord, where are we going to go? Uh, you have what we need. And are we going to say that in our lives? We have in the next pages uh, some principles of moral government which you have spent a good deal of time uh, going over, I understand. And we shall just remark upon these remaining pages of this section and try to reaffirm some basic principles that obviously are God's method of dealing with us in our human relationships. So man is to be regulated by an appeal to right exercise of free choice, we say, in a moral government. Moral government is an association, we say, of moral beings under intelligent supervision of a benevolent ruler. <clears throat> moral government is an arrangement to regulate the conduct of moral beings by enlightening their minds as to what is right and proper and by pronouncing consequences of good and of evil. About ten years ago, there was a great deal of disturbance on our university campuses and in various cities, and a very elevated group of, of uh, judicial leaders and educational leaders uh, were appointed to try to solve why this awful disturbance took place. And they began their treatise in this remarkable way. If they had only maintained this attitude, the, the report might have been tremendously beneficial but I understood from those who have digested the immense report that the report goes on to excuse the criminal, to excuse the rebelliousness of humanity, and to blame society because they didn't believe in the freedom of the will, of course. And so whatever a person does, it's a result of what has been done to the person. It's not then what people do to society, it's what society does to them to cause all the trouble. But look at the beautiful elementary way they began their deliberation. So they said, order is indispensable to society. As soon as you have society, a group of individuals, you've got to have order. Otherwise, there can't be happiness, can there? Then if you're going to have order, you've got to have some rules. So law is indispensable to order. Law is supposed to be a record of what is beneficial for society. But if law is going to mean anything, there has to be enforcement. So enforcement is indispensable to law. My, what a summary of important principles. Would they had followed these principles throughout their document? And so as soon as we have a society, there has to be rules and regulations. Otherwise, there can't be any happiness. And if we don't enforce our rules, they become advice. And what do you think our whole problem of crime is? The lack of enforcement of rules. We have all kinds of psychological technicalities that have been introduced into our society, which are utmost distressingly, aren't they? Are they not? So we see that God follows the same principles. And this is the principle of moral government, isn't it? And so we proceed to, uh, to say a few words about these principles. Uh, as soon as we have a group of people, moral beings, we need a ruler. This ruler must understand what's for our good. He must be worthy to rule, mustn't he? It is for our good that he does rule us. And so here we see some very elementary principles, do we not? And uh, we see that we as moral beings are a distinct order of creation. And so we work this down on your page four. Then we start in your item one in parentheses to distinguish between moral beings and the other methods of God's operations. And so we have a threefold category there. And in your manual, you recall, you have a chart which we call the kingdom of God. And this has this classification of humanity, doesn't it? And everything that God has created is involved in this operation. We call this the kingdom of God. Everything God has created is going to regulate, isn't it? 
If he didn't, he would be sinfully neglectful. So God is not going to create anything that he doesn't regulate. We have the first twofold division, don't we? We have the area of moral government. We have the area of non-moral government. In non-moral government, we have a two-fold division also. We have various masses that have to be moved around by cause and effect. As we develop uh, upon your page five there. Uh, we, we've seen pictures of our world, haven't we? From the moon, a most unthinkable uh, picture to be sure. Here's the mass of our world. No connection anywhere. Obviously, there has to be the force system, as we said, to keep it in its orbit. And here we have this strict law of cause and effect, don't we? Then God has created orders of creatures that have some kind of an instinct in it. All the way from the plant, which has something in it to do something, to the highly mobile animal who has instincts to have a different kind of life. And so all the way through this area, there is an instinctive something, a great mystery that is impelling and motivating the creature to do something. This is the area of non-moral existence, isn't it? When we come to man, it's altogether different. God designed man to be under a free choice operation, of course. But when man revolted against God, God had to change this, as we've seen, and continuously interrupt man's freedom to get certain decisions uh, to be brought into existence. So God may keep a tolerable system in this world because selfishness, if it's let loose, has, will never bring any kind of a society that's tolerable. And if God was not counterbalancing the selfishness of moral beings on every hand and operating millions and millions of times every minute, you might say, uh, trying to balance out the evils of the world that selfish individuals create and develop, if God was not active in his causation, this whole world would completely fall apart because selfishness has nothing that will be consistent and will provide any kind of a, a balanced society. Someday we're going to know more of God's intimate operations here. And this is what we call providence or God's coming into the human me, the mill, and directing certain choices. And God is operating throughout the world and he does not allow evil rulers to come up if people deserve a peaceful, loving ruler. So God is overseeing. Now, we don't have the overall viewpoint that God does. So we need to be very careful that we don't criticize what God is allowing to take place. God does not allow the rulership of the world to be in the happenstance of a few individuals of temper, does he? He's overseeing this whole thing. However, we are to pray and exert our heart influence to God uh, to be influenced uh, in the direction of mercy. And it makes a difference how we pray. And God told us through Paul that we were to exercise ourselves in this way. That God uh, may be as patient as possible. That he may be as tolerable as possible uh, toward all those who are mistreating him. That we might have a better opportunity of proclaiming the gospel and so on. But here we have the great area of God's operations. But when it comes to man, it's all different as we discussed. And here God exerts himself with great energy, doesn't he? We need to distinguish then between these different operations of God, do we not? We give you another chart in your manual, you notice, which we call the domain of God. This is a simplification of the larger chart, as you perceive, and a little different way of classifying. So here we have the classification of creation again. And we have, first of all, the vast realm of material creation. Then we have animate, non-moral creation. Uh, creation that seems to have a life, a part of it, but yet does not have moral values or uh, intelligent appreciation. Then we have free moral beings as the third classification. We have the different characteristics, as we've said, here, we, in the first instance, we simply have masses uh, without any idea of self-locomotion or self-control. Then the, in the second category, we have some kind of a self-contained something that God has put within these different creatures, uh, which has an ability to do something. When it comes to mankind, it's different. 
We have the ability to perceive, to think, to understand. All of these creatures do not have this ability. They, they learn that God has given them enough intelligence to know how to live. And so they know where to find food. They know where all these things. God has given them this intelligence. But they do not have the ability to perceive and evaluate and create ideas and so on. They're always repeating what the, they have observed as a possibility of life. So when it comes to us as human beings, we have the ability to perceive, react, or experience, and decide what we're going to do. What about the method of governing? Here we have simply a cause apply, do we not? We have in the second category an instinct. But we said that it seems impossible uh, to think that the creatures can do what they're doing without an additional operation of God. And so we, we add into this situation some kind of an agitation on the part of God. And as we said, God is doing this for two reasons. Because he's an interesting being and likes to do complicated things. And then secondly, because he's making things so complicated that little proud man cannot put together the universe without recognizing the mystery as to why things are happening. And so this mystery, of course, is God operating behind the scenes in the animal creation and all oh my, the interesting things that are taking place. And we see God's appeal. But when it comes to man, God humbles himself in abeyance, you might say, appealing to us by motives, trying to reason with us, and, and trying to and tell us to, we have to decide what we're going to do, and it's going to have these some consequences. What about the result of governing? Of course, you have exact desired effect in both of the first categories, do you not? But with man, it's different. And when anybody comes along in theological circles and says, you can have free will and still fixity. They're talking opposites like black and white, the same color. As soon as we have free will, there are two possibilities. We can either climb the ladder of virtue ever upward into the being of God, or we can get on the other part of the ladder and sink ever deeply into the abyss of self-development and invention. And so here we have the operation, the ability to choose what we're going to do. What about the nature of this control? Certain and positive. Certain and positive. But when it comes to our situation of free will, uncertain. When you talk about the certain result of free will, you're talking opposites. Now you can say these opposites long enough to begin to believe them. And this is what a new word has been coined in our generation called brainwashing. We never heard about that a couple of decades ago. And so here we, we see the perspective of intelligent viewpoint. So when God created man, he's running a risk, isn't he? He doesn't want mechanized control. There would be no worship. There has to be voluntary uh, recognition of truth and, and uh, self-control. And so God is running a risk. But this is the value of the whole business. God can admire all of these operations other because they're simply his operations. But when it comes to man, he's given us the ability of creativity. And, and, and the result is uncertain. And God is running a great risk when he created mankind in this way. My, how we need to rise to look at the intelligent viewpoint of our whole situation. And my, if our generation doesn't need a review of some of these great matters. Notice the bottom of your page five, we say there has to be enlightenment if man is going to know what to do. And indeed, God has taken great energy, hasn't he, toward this enlightenment. We talked a good deal about this already. Man has to know what he is to do if he's going to be responsible for his choices. We say right action can only follow right understanding. So God must give man the opportunity to know what he should do. And the scripture indicates that God has abundantly done, done this and is doing it now continuously. And so we go over to your page 6 and we try to enumerate some things here as to how God is doing this. And uh, on your A, we mentioned that man is exposed to great moral light through natural observations. And every single personality is observing these wonderful things that God has created, have he not? And so... We have the Apostle Paul making the great statement by inspiration that the, the order of creative observances is so positive and so effective as 
emphasized by the Holy Spirit. And remember, the Holy Spirit is going out throughout the whole world, emphasizing these observations and bringing them to the point of concentration. And Paul says that they are without excuse from natural observation to recognize the deity and existence of God in his proper proportion. In addition to this, God is operating in the conscience. So you have Romans 1, uh, Romans 2, 14 to 16, don't you? How God is operating in the conscience. The Holy Spirit is moving consciences and enlightening. In other words, the Holy Spirit is operating throughout the whole world to make it hard to rebel against God. And, and to, this is the reason for guilty conscience around the world. And this is the reason for worship around the world, is it not? This is because the Holy Spirit is enlightening. If they didn't have the conviction of the Holy Spirit, they wouldn't uh, have these dreadful ways of worshiping, would they? And so the Holy Spirit is operating throughout the whole world. And to remember, we have stated in Romans 2, 12, they that sin without law shall perish without law, and that they who sin with law shall be judged by the law. In other words, God's revelation increases our obligation and our guilt but it's not the basis of enlightenment, according to the scripture. Now this enlightenment appeals directly to our minds, as we have in the second point there. And remember Romans 1.18, holding down in truth and unrighteousness. It's God's description, is it not? And uh, we try to summarize uh, some of the ways in which we observe the wonderful things of our uh, contact. We talked about our inner personalities. We talk about our bodies. We talk about our surroundings. We talk about our daily contact with our fellow beings. In addition to this, man is exposed to great moral influences directly as the Holy Spirit operates. We have uh, John 1, 9. How the Holy Spirit is enlightening every single moral being coming into the world. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. And so the Holy Spirit is working with this enlightenment throughout the whole world, is he not? And uh, we see uh, also what the Holy Spirit was supposed to do. Uh, Jesus said in John 16, he said in verse 8, When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he'll convict the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. So the Holy Spirit is operating throughout the world, convicting of guilt and sin but also convicting of the mercy of God. Because Jesus said a great thing concerning his atonement, didn't he? As in John chapter 12 and verse 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. So it must be that the Holy Spirit is doing two things. Uh, to show mankind guilt, first of all, and then to impress upon mankind everywhere some kind of impression of the mercy of God. And this must be the reason why they worship at all, mustn't it? And I haven't heard of any tribe that does not have some form of worship. So here the Holy Spirit hasn't left the world in darkness. The Holy Spirit is operating throughout the whole world to give adequate light to any moral being that wants it. And that's why we need to find out what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to do what is most important to us, apparently. And, and this is why you have the great migration. This is why some of your students have come so far. Because you are hungering for some truth and for some development and a new desire to serve God. And so God is doing remarkable things. We can't even put together the immensities of the operations of God. That's why God sends some prophet somewhere, some voice to bring witness and traverses thousands of miles sometimes with individuals who are looking for truth. So let's God, let God... Uh, give this great directives. We'd like to talk about Paul. He couldn't go north and he couldn't go south. He, at one of his second missionary journey, he looked at the big cities, Ephesus and so on. He tried to go, no, 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 keep on going west. He gets west and there's, there's the sea. Now, Lord, I couldn't go north, I couldn't go south. Now what do we do? Come over to Macedonia and help us. He gets over there, he doesn't go to the big city. He goes out by the riverbank where a group of folks are seeking the Lord. And that group of folks seeking the Lord was more important at that time than the big city of Ephesus hearing the truth. And so God is operating throughout the world, bless his name. And when we have the full evaluation of man's responsibility and guilt before God, we're going to have a real balance of view, are we not, to see that God 
has truly done everything right and is worthy of our total admiration and appreciation. In addition to this, God gave various enlightenments along the way which we talked about to Adam and Eve before the fall, after the fall, progressively to leaders among uh, the nation there, Israel, and especially to Moses, as we said, and then to dear Jesus who said, I put God on exhibition so you can look at me and see how you should live. This was the great manifestation, wasn't it, of God. Then through the New Testament writers who continued this sacred revelation. Now there has to be consequences, otherwise there's no meaning. So we try to summarize, and you're page seven here, and some of the consequences. And God has to do this. God's a moral governor. He's responsible to produce the result, isn't he? And so these consequences, we point out, have to be uh, in existence. Otherwise, God will fail of his responsibility. And moral government would collapse if he does not have consequences. Because this is the way of regulation of moral beings, isn't it? And we give you some very solemn passages here. Romans 2, 5 to 10 is a very, very summarized passage, isn't it? And I'm so glad and thankful that God is operating in perfect justice and is not accusing or blaming us for anything that we do not have the responsibility of. And God would cease to be righteous then, we mention, if he did not have these consequences. And Jeremiah 9, 24 is a moving passage here describing God as loving righteousness and fulfilling his obligation in loving righteousness. Now these consequences must be according to exact justice, must they not? And I'm so glad, my friends, to be really believe that God is no respecter person. He doesn't elect one to be saved and pass by ten, nine, and then elect number ten to be saved, then pass by to twenty, and all these kind of arbitrary ideas that were taught me in my theological training. And I'm so glad to put my feet upon the universal love of God for humanity and he's doing everything he can for every human being consistent with his moral government and responsibilities. And so he says he's only charging us with our own responsibility and the light we have. He's no respect to persons. He doesn't prefer one above the other. What a remarkable thing to put our feet upon and worship a God like this. And every single moral being is going to acknowledge the true uh, responsibility that God has imposed upon them. And uh, we have these many declarations from the heart of God. Oh, these are such fundamental things. To really be delivered from some of these complexities, these involvements uh, concerning the atonement and, and all of this. It was so afflicting to my mind years ago. And thank God. We can see the universal love and energy of God trying to do what he can. And a great proposition that came out of the New England revival was this. Where sin occurs, God cannot wisely prevent it. Where sin occurs, God cannot wisely prevent it. And God is doing his utmost consistent with man's moral freedom to prevent sin on every hand. He could prevent it by eliminating our existence. But as long as we're here, he can't prevent it. Because we are free moral beings and have the ability of our choice. Now at the bottom of your page 7 and on into 8, we have a beautiful group of scriptures, do we not? These are passages that describe what God wanted to do for Adam and Eve and for the rest of us if we had continued in happy submission. We were to experience favor and friendship with God, were we not, in unending enlargement and depth. We are to partake of the energy and life of God. We have nothing in ourselves. We are dependent creatures. God wanted to bless us, didn't he, with his wonderful bounty. Any man has the Son of God, he has life. This was to be a state of peace, joy, and praise, was it not? From the depth of our heart, we were to rejoice in the Lord, weren't we? And there was to be an endless duration in God's presence, of course. God didn't plan all the tragedies of sin and all that had to happen since man revolted. But now isn't it wonderful? Praise God. As we close that section, God, through the gospel, God allows us once more to be reinstated to him so all the blessings of eternity can be ours. 
if we'll only allow God to have sway and arise out of our selfishness and see the true perspective of reality and be reconciled to God in His great love. We can take off where Adam and Eve left off and have the blessings of the Lord and the deliverance that God wants to give us in this dark world. And what an opportunity to be little lights for our wonderful God. 